Hello everyone, it's Mark Sabatella from Mastering MuseCore here. Welcome to the Music Masterclass. So this is my uh, Thursday series where we talk about music. And we all like talking about music. We like making music and talking about it. That's what we're going to be doing here. And um, yeah, got something maybe, you know, a little different today because we're going to be looking at some things that aren't about scoring it in new score, but are about performance, about, uh, um, you know, creating the music uh, the old-fashioned way um, of, you know, actually playing it and singing it and uh, so forth. And, oh, by the way, maybe notating it also. So that's what we're going to kind of be looking at here. And um, so... Uh, yeah, I want to get started here. I mentioned two pieces in particular that we're going to uh, take a look at. And uh, Colleen, if you're here, which it looks like you are, I'm going to invite you on to talk about your ukulele piece. And if you want to come on board to do so, you're welcome to. <coughs> if you'd rather just chat, that's always fine too. No pressure here. But yeah, I want to talk about your uh, your ukulele piece. Um, which is 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 a it's a cool song and there were some comments about it and we can talk about those and um yeah so uh thank you. i'm bringing up uh i see you're coming on board i see you can i hear you thank you yes i do hear you okay. <laughs> you're kind of quiet do you have your uh, can you uh does it make a difference if I turn my Blue Yeti up volume? Yeah, it should. Can you turn it up more? Yeah. Yeah, keep going. Oh. Yeah. It makes you really loud in my ears, but... Oh, does it? Oh, it shouldn't. It, it um, I wouldn't have thought... I, it, maybe that's just the headphone volume you're turning up. Maybe turn it back down then. Don't worry about it. Uh -oh. um, you just sounded kind of quiet to me. Okay, but that's I'll fine. Speak louder. Yeah, just come closer to it. Gain? Does that do anything? Yeah, gain. That's what you want. Okay, is that better? Better? Uh, better? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, gain. Okay. okay. Gain is gain is your input volume. The other one was your headphone volume. So, gotcha. oh, echoes. Okay, hold on. If uh, people are hearing echoes, let me see about fixing that real quick. All right. Uh, try to talk again. Okay, I'll try to talk again. Can people tell me if uh, you're hearing less echo? That would be good, if so. No echoes. I, yeah, no echoes from me, um, but uh, we'll see if other people are hearing it. Um, all right, so uh, yes, tell, tell us a little bit about this piece that we're going to look at here. Actually, let me load it up into MuseScore. I have it uh, saved. I just need to actually load the thing here, so give me one moment. But yeah, go ahead and tell us about it. Um. <laughs> I I don't know. I just got an idea one morning from a perfume bottle that said Lilac Fields. <laughs> <laughs> and yesterday I noticed three more perfume bottles on my table so I could write three more songs. Oh, Amber nice. Blush and Twilight Woods. And <laughs> but I, anyway, I sense um, a theme. Are they all from the same company? Uh, yeah, bed, the bath. Okay. Bed, yeah. Something, yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, so then I remembered way back a year ago or so that you had us write music to a poem. We chose a poem about fall and yeah. then we wrote a music and I thought that was so cool. So I Googled lavender. It's lavender fields. Lavender. Yeah. I Googled lavender and I found this nice poem by this lady. And so then I just set it to music with my ukulele. Nice. And um, I have to thank Dave in your comments. It's uh -huh. nice to have that community and he saved you some work. He helped me fix a measure <laughs> nice excellent yes i saw so, comments and discussion and i was like yeah. happy to see that and i'm yeah. i'm i'm always happy you know i see my role here as facilitator yes i got some stuff to teach but i want people to be helping each other out yeah. and uh yeah that so, was yeah. so cool of him yeah yeah, yeah. so thanks dave <laughs> okay so um I just downloaded this uh, this morning. I had a copy before, but I downloaded a new copy in case you've made any updates. I have, yeah, yeah. Okay, and so and you have you updated? The, have you up, uploaded your update? So is this like the current version? Yeah, okay. I, I saved it online. Is yeah, that what you perfect. mean? Perfect. Yeah. Yep, that is what I mean. All right. So if I just hit play on this thing, is this going to be pretty representative of what you're looking for? Are there still things that are like, oh, not not the way you want them uh, that you need no, to tell us about I'm, before we listen? I'm headed to the finish line with it. All right. Excellent. <laughs> I'm really happy to hear that. Yeah, yeah. All right. So let's just uh, go ahead and take a listen to this thing. And um, let me turn my volume back up on the uh, on the that that sound. OK, you all hear that? Yes. 
Okay, so here we go. Oh, bottles that say Jim Beam. That's, uh... <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> That's I don't have funny. bottles. I have boxes that say, like, you know, black box and things. That's a wine <laughs> thing. All right, uh, let's, uh, let's uh, go and just uh, listen, and then we can talk about it. Here we go. That is really a nice piece. I like this a lot. I mean, oh, I, I don't, I mean, I know how the ukulele works, um, but I have no insight into actually writing for the thing. And you've been studying this, yes? Mm -hmm. I have been. So, um, like, one of the things that I know about ukulele that, that is always, like, uh, hard to wrap my brain around, and I know a lot of people have this issue also, is that the arrangement of strings is a little funny in that what you would think is your lowest string is actually an octave higher than you want it to be, right? Your The bottom string is not the lowest string, right? It can be. Ah. It, there are low G ukuleles and high G ukuleles, and that was something Dave pointed out to me in his comment that I need to go back and look at is somewhere on MuseScore you can choose if you're going to use True. High G or low G. And so I guess I lucked out. I chose the right one. because. Now, I... do you own a low G ukulele? Yeah, I have both of them. Uh -huh. Okay, cool. And this, though, is, uh, I can high tell, G. is high G because uh -huh. I look at that. Because this would have been an ascending arpeggio if that had been a, a low, because, you know, the, this would be the lowest string. Right. But it's clearly mm -hmm. not because I hear it. I hear it going down. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's, you know, that is the more common ukulele is the, is the high G. Now, the low G one, is the low G one that you have also a whatever soprano ukulele? No, or... my high G is called a concert ukulele. Oh, yes, yes. And the low G is called a, a tenor. Tenor, yeah. So, and is it, I, I'm, you know, I looked at, I looked into this stuff a little bit, like, I don't know, 10 years ago or so, and was a little bit up on what was, uh, you know, what was what in the ukulele world, but I've, I've kind of forgotten what I thought I knew. Is what I, what I'm remembering is that the concert ukulele isn't tuned differently than whatever the next smaller size is, soprano, I guess, soprano. but it's just, it's a no, little, the same. it's just bigger, right? They're the same. And they like to use the soprano more for just those strum, 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 strum songs. Ah, but the concert one is just a little bit bigger, and so it gives you it's, a little more room on the fingerboard? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And so likewise with the tenor. Gotcha. They just keep getting a little bigger. Yeah. But at some point, is it at the tenor, or is there there's a baritone ukulele, right? I think so. Because um, I think that's the one where it's actually intended to be tuned lower. Oh, I don't know. Okay, um, I'm not sure about that either, but I know there's... Should have invited my ukulele teacher along yeah. this morning. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's 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 good for us to know about writing for ukulele because it is it is its own unique thing. I mean, you can know, think you know how to write for solo guitar, but writing for, sol writing for solo ukulele is another thing. Now, as you say, a common use of ukulele is just to strum chords, and that's, that's fine, and people definitely do that. Right, but right. what you're doing here is not that. No, I like the, uh, it's called, um, what does he call it? Well, he calls it instrumental ukulele, but it's uh, melody and chords okay. together. You do both at the same time. And now I'm learning a little percussion. Mm. <laughs> so you do the melody and chords. And the, those little dots that you see, see those little dots? That's where I strum and then hit the ukulele. <laughs> it's a, and it makes like a little, uh, like the rim shot on the snare drum. Okay, so you've but got your ukulele there, right? Yeah. I, I need to stop sharing my screen so so people it can see what you're doing. It doesn't come out in the Muse Score playback, though. That yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's let's thing. let's go <laughs> play. Huh? I want oh, we want to oh, hear oh, you play oh. a little bit. I do, anyhow. You haven't practiced for this. Um, let's see. I 
practice that tapping, Mark. That's all right. That's fine. We wanted to see the technique, and that's great. It's, that's what you do. Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> nice. I really enjoyed seeing that, so thank you. Um, I am going to go back to the screen share so we can talk a little bit more about the music, but uh, definitely wanted to uh, get to see the, the real instrument there. And so while writing that, you definitely had that like uh, luxury of being able to, um, you know, know, is this playable? Because you have the instrument. You know, if I tried to write right. for ukulele, I'd be guessing. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, so uh, I need to just do a little surgery here to make sure you can see what I'm seeing again because I froze that and now I need to get it going again. Give me a moment. Okay, so one of the things that I'm curious about is, oh, by the way, the other word that you will sometimes hear for um, what's uh, this type of writing where you're playing the melody and the chords together, um, chord melody. Chord melody, that's it. Yeah, yeah. That's what he calls it. Yeah, yeah chord melody. Um, yeah. Uh, that's a term that's used in the jazz guitar world. world. I'm writing a chord melody arrangement. Uh -huh. you'll, some, you'll hear people use the word finger style, which doesn't exactly mean the same thing, but sometimes people use it as if it did. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, involves plucking things as opposed to strumming things, I guess, and so people, yeah, so, yeah. but, but finger style doesn't necessarily mean chord melody. It, it could just mean arpeggiating and stuff, but, uh, um, so one of the things that I'm curious about in here is, uh, like when we just were listening to the playback, I feel like I want to see what's actually going on. We are hearing both staves playing back or we're not hearing both staves playing back. Yeah. It looks like we are. You didn't actually mute one of them, right? You mean piano? There's piano playing? Or two well, no, no, no. I'm just oh, that there's two, two staves. There's the melody. Yeah. So it's two ukuleles. Oh. Is that the idea that you're writing for two no, ukuleles? That what, no, huh? That wasn't okay. my idea. I And then I, you know, I got that from Dave, too. I, and you had told me, too, to check into that linked stave. So it's probably because I didn't link the staves together. Gotcha. Well, the thing is, if you did link the staves together, we would be seeing this whole chord notated on the first note. And we don't. And I, and frankly, I don't want to. I like how you oh. have it here, where we oh, just okay. see a melody and chord symbols. So someone could, like, I can play this thing myself if I want, right? Yeah. And I can, I can play these things. You know, I guess that's from a, from a being a pianist. I like to see that. Yeah. Piano thing up there. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I'm, I'm with you there. Yeah. So. Uh, so, but what I'm curious about, like, if I actually mute that top staff and now only play the bottom one, I'm not hearing the melody, right? Like, this F is not part of this chord. So, oh, when, you, when you played that, how no, that, is... That should be an A. Well, that's what I was going to ask about also, oh. because... Uh, well, how did those notes get changed? So I had, that's how that G got changed to an F. I, it, uh -huh. I don't think I do it, Mark. I think. Yeah. yeah. Well, I. <laughs> I think um, does it. Yeah, um, it's possible. It's it's also yeah. There's any number of things that are possible. That's supposed as to, how to be it an A, which is the top string, and then it would come out as the melody note. There yes. we go. So yes, that sir. is yeah. supposed to be the A, and that's yeah. my dog is sweet. Yeah. So this is that note. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. And now this G is that mm -hmm. G. Yeah. yeah, this C is that C, third, third fret, this E yeah. is oh, that E, yeah, uh, so, yeah. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Mm -hmm. And then this G is not that, but it's... It's the third, this the one. second line, yes. yes. Yeah, so you have notes in your chord above the melody, which is going to be kind of unavoidable when you have, because the thing about a ukulele is the range is really restricted, right? You only right. have an octave to work with as opposed to a guitar where you have two. So you're often going to have these situations where you're just to get four voices in there, you're going to have to have some things voiced above the melody and it's going to have to be okay. Casey said it's okay. Yeah, I, yeah I, I agree it's okay. One of the things that I remember when you had another ukulele piece that we talked about that I still think could be kind of interesting is to take this B here and delay it, you know, move that into, uh, like, make these be eighth notes here 
and uh, or actually, let me change this. I'm going to make that a quarter note. I'm going to delete that from there, but I'm going to add it here. Oops, wrong, wrong thing. Uh, there we go. So that we hear the B after the G. Okay. Uh, I, I just want to hear what that sounds like. So that by putting it afterwards, the ear might register it a little bit more as not the melody. Uh -huh. um, on a real ukulele, though, you don't need to do that. Like when you play it, you could actually pluck the G slightly before strumming the rest of it. Right, right. And so you could, and you could strum, pluck it a little louder than you strum the rest of it. Right? There's yeah. all sorts of things you can do yeah. in performance to bring that melody out um, that, you know, MuseScore won't quite have. But uh, did Casey ever talk about anything like that, taking those upper notes and just doing things with them to make them less prominent? Um, and no, we didn't go there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's just, yeah. Uh, I'm just like experimenting with this myself to try to yeah. understand, like if I were trying to write what things I would try. So like, I still hear this B as part of the melody, but if I take this G and actually get rid of the four and the zero, but add them over here. So that it's the melody on the beat and the rest of the chord on the offbeat. Gotcha. I want to. I want to hear that one now. Yeah, that this makes those chords too close together. But anyhow, those are the kinds of things that you can, you can play with, with. Uh -huh. or you can just accept the fact that a ukulele is a ukulele and not a guitar, and you're going to have notes above the melody, and it's going to be okay. Yeah. 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 So that's that is mm -hmm. fine. But yeah, th these, those are things to play with. Um, did you say there was another note that's not that's not the right note? Uh, no, I just mentioned measure six, but that's the one that we I fixed with Dave. Ah, gotcha. That, measure. that G was an F. <laughs> ah, okay, and that was the one. Yeah, well, you said you were hearing them both, and that's because yeah. one yeah. one staff was one, and the other was the other. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Cool. Um, yeah. No, this is. I just. Yeah, I really like this. Uh, the piece and the overall vibe of it. And one of the things that I noticed right off the bat was I was like, oh, that F against the A minor chord is, is kind of dissonant, right? If you have an A minor chord yeah, but... with an F in the melody, it's kind of yeah. dissonant. And I was expecting to hear that right off the bat. And then when I play, hit play, I'm like, wait a minute, I don't hear that F. And then I started wondering if you labeled the chord wrong and it was really meant to be D <laughs> minor. Sorry. And then I started looking at the notes to try to sort out, okay. So for people who don't know, the tuning of the uh, ukulele is basically, uh, right? Uh, the... or, or it's. Ah, Which one if is you have the low one, right? This is have... the low one. Yeah. yeah, so either way, it's a G. The bottom the bottom string is the G. Right. And right. then, th so a G at second fret is A. And then the next is a C. And the next one is an E. And the next one is an A. So if you're wondering how a ukulele is tuned, it's tuned basically to a C6 chord or an A minor 7 chord, depending on how you want to look um, at it, but uh, with the strings scrambled. Miriam has a question about how we enter the notes on the ukulele staff on the bottom. Ah, but it's, yeah. it's so easy and it's so cool. You just push in, you push in, and then you put the cursor there and it makes a zero and then you change it to two, three, or four, or five, whatever fret you want. It's yeah. very easy. Yes. Yeah. So this is this is what's called tablature, Miriam. And tablature is a system, yeah, in which it uses uh, numbers just to tell you which, which fret to play which string on. And yeah, it, it's once you've created a tablature staff, and to create them, you'll go to Edit Instruments, and you'll see it says ukulele tablature that she's added here. And if I type ukulele into the search bar, you'll see right there is ukulele tablature. So that's how you add that to your score. Once you have a tablature staff, and there's guitar tablature, bass tablature, all, all of those types of instruments, banjo, have tablature options. And then you then you can actually just, like if, if you say, oh, I want to play this string here on, what is that string? That's the G, 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 E string. That's I'm I'm on the second to top one. Oh, so that's e, the right. yeah, that's e. the E string. And if I decided, hey, I want to play that E string on the third fret instead of the bottom string, I could put a three there. Mm -hmm. And now I still have a G, but um, 
but it's that, except I didn't change. Which is, and that's exactly what you would do if you're yeah. playing it on a low G ukulele. Ah, yes. Good You'd point. Play it with th three. Yeah. Yeah, because if this was a low G ukulele, the nice thing about the low G ukulele is that this A would be an octave lower. You'd get a low A out of it. But then this G here would not be in the right octave if you played it on the low G. So right. instead of putting it there, you would put it here. Right. Same right. note, but uh, now it's in the correct octave. Yeah. So anyhow, that's that's how you do things. You use the cursor keys to move between the strings. You type a number, and it puts a fret, and it puts a fret marking on that number. So tablature is its own world for guitar, and really, it's very well suited to guitar because having to read standard notation on on guitar or ukulele or banjo is kind of a drag. Because yeah, that same note is played on two totally different places. Like. I can't even imagine if that was the case on piano, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> if 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 middle C was like two different places on the piano where middle C was, that would that would kind of suck. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you'd be reading music and you'd see middle C. Oh, I know what note it is, but which where one? do I play it? Well, you know, yeah, which yeah, one? Yeah. And and the um, thing is, the piano is laid out with the white keys and the black keys, and I can find all my C's really easy. Boom, 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 boom. But you give me a guitar and ask me to find all the C's or a ukulele, and I don't know. I got to count frets. Right, right. Um, what about Dave's idea of showing the top voice, the top line as a voice instead of ukulele? Yeah, so if you wanted this to, to not be, like right now, I just muted it, and so we're not even hearing it at all. But yeah, it, I could totally go, um, I would, you know, right click this staff and say staff part properties, and then change instrument, and I could change it to anything else, you know, change it to voice, um, you know, for some reason. Uh, the idea of harmonica is appealing to me, and I'm going to try that. Because, um, you know, the voice sounds in music are kind of weird, and, you know, so uh, I, I want to try a harmonica. But then I need to come back here and unmute it again. Oh, it is unmuted. I didn't realize it would actually make a sound. I thought it was just a label. <laughs> yeah. No, but if I do this. You can change that. It, it changes it, the sound. Ah. Right, so now it's playing the the oh, uh, harmonica melody along with it. Somehow that just feels like a good fit, a fit mm -hmm. to ukulele. But yeah, clearly I could also make it be a voice or anything else that I wanted. They often play together, people that perform Weird. the harmonica what? and the ukulele. Yeah, I mean, they, they're both kind yeah. of... They, 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 they're kind of semi-folkloric instruments, right? They're instruments that, you know, you expect your, you know, uh, people of a certain generation to have lying around the house, turn of the... Not, you know, going from the 19, you know, the, basically people who were alive in 1920 <laughs> owned ukuleles and harmonicas and played them more regularly. Right. Yeah. Um, so as far as Dave's question about whether guitarists prefer tab or chord charts, I mean, it totally depends on the guitar player. Um, tab tells you exactly what to play. And so if you have a very specific arrangement with very specific voicings that you want played and very specific rhythms, this thing that you see on the top, the lead sheet, melody, and chord symbol, that's not enough. That's not enough to tell you exactly the voicings to play. On the other hand, it gives the guitar player more freedom to create their own arrangement. So if the guitar player wants freedom, they'll want to see this kind of lead sheet style thing. If they want to, if they want to reproduce something exactly, they're going to want to see the tablature or standard notation if they're used to, if they know how to, uh, um, if they know how to read standard notation for guitar and apply it because that's, yeah, it's a whole adventure in itself. Cool. So anything else that you wanted to talk about in here? I mean, I, like I said, I really like the piece. It, it It's melodically, you know, sounds really good and uh, it's got, you know, the right kind of feel of having... You know, I don't know, it's got interesting chords that, you know, aren't complicated, and yet they go with the lyrics, and the melody goes with the lyrics. Yeah. I mean, I just like it. So, I, so is it Geis or Geis? Geis? Heis. Heis. Uh, I can't, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm like, got coffee in my throat, but that, <laughs> I, that sound. I think it would Heis that, that suggested uh, not so much A minor on the ends of everything, and so I was really happy when I added the... Uh, Two E sevens and a D seven. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like, so like, I didn't. Uh, I'm not seeing that version anymore. But if this phrase, okay, let me turn off that harmonica now because it's distracting. It's just everywhere there's an E seven. It used to be an A. It minor. used to be an A minor. Yeah. So like right here. Yeah, 
I mean, that's really nice. That's a four yeah. chord going to a five chord yeah. there. And then it's sort of this deceptive resolution kind of coming back to two, I guess. And yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's it's um, yeah. Coming back to a coming back to the tonic chord too much is definitely an easily solvable problem. You know, Again, just, a little help from the community. It's yeah, so nice. Yeah, it really is. And so sometimes just, you know, having someone point that out that, hey, that's an yeah. awful lot of the tonic chord. Um, then uh, you just find opportunities to replace some of them, replace some of those one chords with threes, replace some of them with six. Or if it happens to work like at the end of a phrase, five is absolutely what we expect at the ends of phrases, because that leads us back into the next phrase. Yeah. And you have to have you have to buy a different string for a yes. low G and a high G. You do. And so can any concert uh, ukulele mm -hmm. support that if you just put yeah. on a thicker string? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. OK. So yeah, there you go. So yeah, if you put on a thicker string, because yeah, it, the problem is if you've used just the regular, the regular higher G string, yeah, you could try to loosen it to get it an octave lower, but that's going to be too loose. It's not going to yeah, make sound. No, it's, no, just no. Gonna, it's just going to thud. And so I, yeah, my reason I just wanted a bigger try a bigger size. <laughs> ah, okay. So. Yeah. Okay, well, I know you probably need to be uh, on I'm your sorry way. Sorry to leave. Yeah, yeah thank but you. No, this 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 is this good. is really fun, Mark. Thank you. Oh well, yeah. you're welcome. It's yeah. fun for me too. It's it's just good to have music. All right. Well, enjoy uh, the rest community. of your morning. Okay. <laughs> See you, you later. Bye okay. bye. Bye. Uh, I need to actually. I need to buy you. Oh, well, you you oh. can buy yourself to to I'll leave. Just leave. Okay. Yeah, because you got to do that anyhow, right? Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye. But what I have to do normally is uncohost her. All right. So um, Miriam was the. Uh, wait a minute. Am I lying? It's Miriam, right? Who has the uh, um, the improvisation? And that's the other thing that I said I want to talk about today. So I've invited her on to talk about uh, her improvisation here and we'll uh, see where that discussion might happen to go and feel free to keep me asking questions about ukulele and colleen's piece but uh you know i'll do my best to answer uh all right miriam hi <laughs> hello all right you sound uh you, you you sound good today i mean i i know when we tried to do this before uh, uh, last week i had you do things and then it cut you off so sorry about that but uh What's things, okay? things sound good now. I so um, <laughs> great. So um, tell us a little bit like I, I didn't even ask Colleen to introduce herself and give anything about her background because um, uh, uh, because I know her. I've known her for a number of years. And so I sort of forget that. Well, not everyone knows every, you know, uh, everything about everyone. <laughs> uh, but um, as there's a song, I know a little bit about a lot of things, but I don't know enough about you. So t tell us a little bit about uh, your background and uh, before we listen to your piece. Okay, well, uh, actually, um, I'm a professor and I in, in medicine and uh, decision analysis, totally different field. Wow. <laughs> but I enjoy music enormously and um, I love uh, improvising and sometimes my improvisations become compositions so I uh, write them down and that helps me actually to let go and, and start anew with something different and so I enjoy doing that and you know during the COVID pandemic I decided to take the plunge and put some of my music out on Spotify and also I've written uh, a book on improvising uh, classical and minimalistic music and that's out on uh, Amazon. Not that it's making a lot of money though. <laughs> it's, it's just more of a joke that, for me than anything else, but I enjoy doing it and uh, I just think it's fun. Well, that's that's great. And you know, yeah, the thing with music is, I mean, as as careers go, it is possible to have a music career and it doesn't necessarily look like what people imagine, you know, there's all the famous musicians who are, you know, making whatever they're making, doing what they're doing, putting out CDs and being on TV and doing all this other stuff. But um, that's not what a normal music career looks like. It's it's a lot of little thing as um one of my teachers once said oh yeah music career is great you know you go out and you do gigs you can make tens of dollars that that was always his his thing <laughs> tens of dollars because yeah that's approximately what your average 
thing you would do. You play a gig, you do a teach a lesson, you you do it a whatever, and you might make seventy bucks. That was that's a typical thing to get paid. Um, but then you do enough of them, they add up. So I'm I'm really curious, especially before we get in more to the music there when you mentioned putting stuff on spotify i've never explored that what what is what's uh what's that like what's involved oh, it's actually pretty easy um i'd have to look up what the the program is called or the um, the website but it's basically a website interface and you um upload your mp3s and uh, you pay some money um, and then off it goes. And then it's uh, basically the um, platform makes sure that it goes into a whole lot of digital um, music platforms. Okay. So, um, well, thanks, Dave. You've uh, found the book already on Amazon. Oh, nice. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, great. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that's, uh, that is very cool. I'm going to look to check that out in a bit, too. Um, so, uh, like... I know that there's services like back in the day there was CD Baby and uh, that was a place where you could like get your CDs into stores and make them available online before you knew how to before there was other ways of doing that and then they started to get into that business of going to of making your music available on iTunes before Spotify was a thing but I don't know I mean I think I still have an account on CD Baby but I haven't really looked into it but you don't remember the name of the one you used Actually I just looked it up it's uh, TuneCore tune core okay. yeah all right and i had a pretty good uh, i'll put the link into the chat um and yeah the experience was actually it was pretty easy um i found it sort of interesting to do it it's one of those little things that you know in the COVID pandemic lockdown period i sort of explored all of this stuff and uh, yeah just did it that that's great and because you know that's that that's like the best thing that could have come out of that is people deciding to pursue a passion project that um you know might not have been pursued otherwise and everyone's pursuing different things and so like the thing that you pursue is a value to someone else because they're off doing their own thing and like just mm -hmm. looking at the title of your book you know there's not a t there's a ton of resources out there for improvisation if your focus is jazz or rock yeah that's right. <laughs> There's not a ton of resources for improvisation in any other context. Mm -hmm. In India, there are for Indian music. I will say that, but uh, that's but but for the kind of thing that you're talking about here, yeah. There's not a ton of resources. I've seen like one or two books that have you know, you know that are actually popular enough to show up on a, in a bookstore. But I, when I've looked at them, I'm like, eh. I'm not, uh, you know, they don't necessarily do anything for me. So I, I feel like there's plenty of room for more of this sort of thing. So I definitely uh, encourage people to check this out. Yeah, and I was lucky because somebody in the UK, I have no idea who he, is, he or she is, but they wrote a very nice review. Oh, nice. Amazon. <laughs> so, and then all of a sudden the thing started selling a little bit. Oh, great. Very yeah, cool. I can, I can buy my bread from the income. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. That is wonderful. So, um, what is this? We ship internationally. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, all right. So let's let's hop over to where your music is here, and I want to hit the hit the play button on this in a moment. But before I do, um, uh, you, what 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 should we what should we talk about here? What should I be playing? Um, you know, let 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 us know what's going on. Let me oh. open this in another link. Well, I can say that most of these pieces, um, you know, they, they started when I was somehow trying to express my emotions. Um, and then gradually I would play around with some chord sequence. Um, and then sort of the melody would come. And then I'd play, I play this for, uh, for maybe a couple of weeks until it sort of develops into something that I can memorize easily. Uh, and that's the time when I think, okay, now I better write it down and, and move on to something else again. So then I write it down and then I try to let go and, and start on something else. Um, and, and a lot of them are, as I said, you know, associated with actually sad moments. That's why it's called mel melancholic. Um, so um, probably the most, you know, the one that I'm probably the proudest of is Farewell. I okay. really like that one. 
And interestingly enough, the way it's written in the book is just different from the way it's on the, the Spotify version. But that's because, you know, it develops and then, uh, or I add a piece or I mix things or whatever. It, it, it's never one on one. It's not exact. Okay. All right. I, uh, I have uh, queued it up here. And since it's on Spotify, there's nothing in particular to look at. So I'm just going to leave, uh, leave this on us uh, rather than screen sharing the Spotify window. Um, so, uh, so uh, yeah, I'm going to play Farewell, OK? OK. All right, here we go. So let's uh, take a listen to Farewell.
Yeah, that is just gorgeous. Um, yeah, I I love so much about that, and I'm looking forward to talking uh, you know a little bit more about the, the the process when you describe it as being improvisation turned composition, and and really get a little deeper into what that means. But before I do that, I do want to address like your very specific question about Mahler, or not a question, but comment about him because. I'm familiar with Mahler-ish, you know, I hear bits and pieces of things there, but I don't know, I don't know his music. There's a big Mahler fest here in Boulder every year that's like really big. A lot of people here are really into Mahler. Someday I'm going to go, um, but I haven't yet. Um, so there was like the... Or, you know, some little passage like that that I could totally imagine have been being a handful of horns in a Mahler piece or something. Is that what you were referring to? Um, well, this one is specifically inspired by the C2 Blauen Organ. Um, it's one of the, his songs. And the way um, that's also in, uh, in F minor, if I recall. Oh, no, that's not. No, the the key um, is actually not the same, but that uh, the the bum 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 bum. Yeah, that's... that that piece is really very typical, and it also comes back, I think, in his fourth symphony somewhere. Gotcha. And yeah, that's the part. Yeah, that that I was attempting to like remember approximately what it sounded like. Um, so um, yeah, so tell us a little bit more um, about the process of creating that piece. Okay, so um, usually when I start, I start out with a, a chord sequence um, and I just play chords and I try to find a, a chord sequence that I like. Um, sometimes I uh, borrow a chord sequence from a, uh, a classical composer. Sometimes I use something fairly standard like the decreasing uh, fifths. Uh, um, um sometimes I just sit behind the piano and, and, and go searching until I have something that I like. Um, I can say that after I did the uh, jazz holiday course <laughs> last year, um, my chord sequences have become a lot more interesting. And I ah, okay, well, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, especially the uh, C seventh with the flat at ninth. I really like that one. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, and also the just the um, uh, the C uh, the the um, major seventh, and then adding in a ninth. I really like that one too. Okay. And also the the minor seventh, adding in a ninth. I like that. So I've I've been exploring far more interesting chord sequences since we did that course. I think. Nice. Um, so then once I have a chord sequence sort of in my head and I've, uh, and I've found the notes, then I try to find something in the left hand, either arpeggio or an Alberti bus or you know, try to find something that is easy for me to, to play and not have to think about it. And then once that's <laughs> in my hands and I'm able to switch, you know, the, from the uh, and go through the chord sequence with that in my in my left hand, then I will just start playing around with trying to find a melody that sort of works with it. Do you record yourself as you're doing that so that if you stumble on something you like, you 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 can get it back or you just stop to try mm -hmm. to write it down or try to remember it or what? And uh, I, I don't record it at that stage. I usually only start <laughs> recording when it's a little bit further along. But if I stumble on something that I like, I try to recreate it and put it into my head. And yes, sometimes I forget it. And yeah. then it's like, all right, then I just go looking for something new. <laughs> yeah, because you can't, I mean, yes, you could just start a recording device or start something recording the moment you start playing. And then as soon as you find something you like, you know it's recorded and you can go back and find it. But realistically, you'll just end up with gigabytes full of useless recordings, <laughs> right? And so I always have a piece of paper if I'm going to be in that mode handy. And if I see, you know, if I play something that I'm interested in, I will write basically my own scribble notation. You know, it might be manuscript paper, it might not. But if it's manuscript paper, I'll just put like dots. I won't try to put rhythms. I won't try to put stems on them. I'll just put dots on the lines to remind me what notes were and try to space them out to approximate the rhythms and then figure uh, it'll come back to me later based on that. And if it doesn't come back exactly the same way, that's okay. Yeah, so uh, sometimes I record when I'm improvising and there's two pieces uh, in the album that are real improvisations mm. and that I by chance 
I was in the mood and I had recorded it and um, you know then I, I played around a bit and then by you know at some point I, I just created something that I thought was hmm, this is actually pretty nice let's put it on the album nice. uh, but I, I wouldn't be able to reproduce those because right. I, I just never wrote them down and were they ones that you also were improvising the actual chords or did you have a chord progression for those two I was just improvising the chords and improvising the, the melody and everything. I don't know. I just got into some space where it just happened. Well, well the thing is, if you play happened. enough music and you have an awareness of what you're doing, I mean, if you're in the key of F, you know what the diatonic chords are going to be and you know some of these common motions that happen, the circle of fifths and so forth. You, you can totally improvise chord progressions that make sense without a ton of work, really. Yeah. Uh, Really, the hardest thing about this process for people who, have, who don't really do this is the thing that she was talking about, about creating some pattern and then some arpeggiation pattern and getting good at doing this while playing melody on top of it. Um, that coordination thing of being able to keep that pattern going while improvising can sometimes be like more annoyingly difficult than you want it to be. <laughs> In, in jazz, I never do that. I don't keep repeating patterns. I focus on my melody. And then there's like a call and response between my hands rather than constantly having to worry about keeping this left hand rhythm going. That's not a part of jazz improvisation so much, but it is a huge part of this type of music because it is about that flow. And so you need to establish that flow, practice that flow and make it happen. So there's some questions yeah. in, the, in the chat. Um, yeah, Dan's asking about recording, and I was curious also, like, yeah, what you actually used to do the, the, the final recording there. Um, yeah, so I have a, a digital piano. Uh, I've even forgotten what, what make it is. I don't <laughs> go downstairs and have a look. But I can just record a MIDI on that, or I can record straight to MP3. And sometimes what I'll do is I'll record it MIDI on the piano, and then I will, and then I can still change the instruments um, uh, when I make the MP3. So, but I can do that from the piano. So then I record it to an MP3 via the piano and change the instruments at the same time, which is sort of fun because then I can to add in something interesting that I like. And I, there's something that I did with with that. Cool. And yeah, like, so the, the actual final recording, th this was something I was like mildly curious about, but didn't try to obsess about it at all. That final recording was recorded just straight from a digital piano? Yep. Because that wasn't obvious, I would say, right? I mean, digital piano technology has gotten to the point where, of course, we're not hearing the actual thing live. If I was sitting there live hearing a digital piano coming through a speaker versus hearing an actual grand piano in the same room, I would tell the difference. But by the time you record it, upload it to Spotify, download it, and listen to it through a live stream, any subtle difference between an acoustic yeah. piano and a digital is yeah. gone. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, also hearing it now through the live stream the, you know, the quality is a lot yeah. less than if you go to Spotify and actually play it from Spotify. Sure. And and yeah, I should have mentioned that. Yeah, that I could have just told, suggested that people do that. Um, I had to log into Spotify to get it to play. I don't know if that's like normally, I mean, I have an account and a paid account and all, so I can do that. But I think normally you have limited capability of playing individual tracks. Is that? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I also have a yeah. Spotify account. Yeah, but yeah. it's uh, so. But the album is on all sorts of digital platforms. So you know, mm. if you're using iTunes or I don't know something else or Apple, then uh, you should be able to find it there as well. If you just type in "melancholic piano" and my name. Nice. When you were talking about chord progressions, by the way, you, I, you know, you, you, you talked about all these different things that you did, but the one thing you didn't talk about, I have to at least mention, is the part where you had, or whatever the thing was, that whole one minor four one thing. You, yeah, I could not comment on that because whether or not you would have done that before I started talking about it, you, you definitely did that, right? And that's something yeah, I talked uh, about a lot. Yeah, I, I had that. Uh, I I discovered that one by by chance. 
Yeah. And then when you talked about it, I thought, oh, well, of course, that's what There's I do. There's that thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because I, you know, I talk about it not because I invented it, but because it's it, it really is all over the place. But yeah. until someone points out how common it is and how powerful it is when it gets used, it's one of those things you, you, just, you, you can go an entire lifetime without really noticing that chord progression and notice uh, how big it is until until someone points it out. Yeah, but what I realized, um, the the thing that makes it nice is that because when you think about it, it's um, the, the flat at ninth from the dominant uh, seventh chord is in there. That's what's yes. making it sound so nice. It's scale degree flat six. We're in the yeah. key of F. I, uh, I'm not sharing my screen right now, but you can take my word for it. I'm in the key of F, and then this is a D flat I'm playing here. It's scale okay. degree flat six in the key of F, and it makes a B flat minor chord that comes to F, but that same note is the flat nine of the five chord, C7 flat nine. This is a D flat coming back. So this is five to one using that scale degree flat six, but this is minor four to one, and it's all about that scale degree flat six. That scale degree flat six is, it's, it's like, gold <laughs> it is gold yeah so what yeah. i find fascinating about those chords is all those relationships between the chords and how some chords are actually the same chord but just uh with a seventh note added to it and uh, well, I, I really find that really, really fascinating yeah um, and we were talking about the ukulele earlier and i mentioned that it's tuned c of G, C, E, A. And depending on how you look at it, that's either a C6 chord or it's an A minor 7 chord, depending on which you think of as the root. And uh, so, yeah, there's there's a lot of chords that have this uh, ambiguous quality to them. Yep. Um, so one other thing that I was really curious about on that piece that I'd love to hear you uh, talk about is form wise, there were like different sections to the piece. And they worked together. And on on like, that was the first time I listened to that particular piece all the way through. And yet there were places where like, I think, uh, um, someone mentioned, uh, it was maybe Dennis or someone. Uh, yeah, the Mahler quote at the end. Um, there was quotes at the end, of, towards the end of the piece where there were motifs that I remembered hearing earlier. And that's, you know, mm -hmm. what you want to have happen in a composition. You don't expect it in an improvisation. You expect oh, this thing that you played five minutes ago, you, you will have forgotten it as the improviser. But as a composer, you can bring that back. And yet, so you really tied these separate sections together well. So that must have been a whole process of putting that together. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, then then um, uh, then it's really become a a composition when I do that. Mm -hmm. So yes, uh, actually, I started out with more the the latter part, and then at some point I thought, hmm, but it needs an introduction, uh, uh, and then I thought, oh well, maybe I should do some arpeggio stuff uh, as an introduction. So that's sort of the way that that developed. Yeah, I mean, and that's definitely a thing, and that's you know, obviously when you're purely improvising, it's all real time. <laughs> the beginning of your improvisation is the beginning. But if you're composing, I think this is a mistake that people often make is they assume the first notes they write is the beginning of the piece. And that's just not necessarily the case. In fact, there's a, 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 a famous composer in the jazz world uh, named Maria Schneider. And she um, I don't have a, a pad with me, but she is a big fan of, of uh, orchestra paper. Like, you know, there's big sheets of manuscript paper that have like tons of staves on them that you can use to, to write orchestra scores. And she writes her pieces starting with a pad of this big orchestra paper going right to the middle. The <laughs> first note she writes is right in the middle of that thing so that she doesn't think she's writing the first note, but then she can build uh, around from there. And I always thought that was pretty fascinating that that's how she does things. Well, that's easy with new score. I mean, if you think, oh, it needs something in the beginning, then you're just adding a couple of bars. And <laughs> it, There's a difference between it being physically easy and mentally easy, because yeah, sometimes yeah. people have a hard time taking themselves out of that world and realizing, yeah, I can... 
I have permission. <laughs> it's not about technical ability. It's about permission, giving yourself permission to uh, grow things that way. Um, and so Larry, I see Larry has a question about flat six or flat 13, and or maybe it's not a question as much as an observation. He, here's a distinction that I would make. Um, I've been, when I was talking about flat six, I was talking about it as a scale degree in the key of F, one, two, three, four, five, six, flatted is flat six. So if I'm talking about it as a scale degree, I'm always gonna call it flat six. However, if I'm talking about it in terms of a chord, like an F chord, with that note in it, then I might call it flat 13 for, you know, jazz reasons. Um, <laughs> bum, 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 bum. I, I build my chord up in thirds, and I'll probably call it a flat 13. But, um, but yeah, if I'm talking about it as a scale degree, I'm always going to call it flat 6. Um, Dave talking about a, pa a painter and their canvas and uh, starting with a wash first. And some people I know don't even start with a, a color wash as much as they'll deliberately create a texture and then use that as, as a uh, basis. But yeah, blank white canvas can be distracting um, for sure because I, I do a bunch of that. And, and yeah, I agree that can be distracting and it's nice to have something down first. All right, any um, final words that you want to, you know, uh, questions, comments, whatever, Miriam, that uh, you want to get in? Yeah, just give it a go. It's fun to do. And uh, I, I just love uh, playing around with those beautiful chord sequences and putting in nice melodies. And yeah. I, I really do need to have the inspiration somehow that uh, doesn't always work. <laughs> yeah, and but that's what's I mean, and that's the thing about improvisation is you can always do something, you know, you can always improvise something. There's sort of a different aesthetic that says, oh, yeah, that was good enough as an improvisation. But was it worth building a composition around? Maybe, maybe not. But, you know, improvisation you can always do. And then some of them can become compositions and they don't all have to. Yeah. Um, could you, uh, Miriam, post, uh, type in the uh, book title? Dan was asking that. I think the link is up earlier also, but just to make sure it's there again, you know, you just okay. type in the title. All right. Well, um, I want to thank you for being here. Thanks for the beautiful music. That was, again, just, just gorgeous. Well, thank you for inviting me. Sure. It was an honor. <laughs> okay. Thanks. All right. So um, I, again, want to thank people being here. And I'm going to go ahead and do a uh, screen share just so we can watch um, uh, can watch the music masterclass music come by. By the way, by the way, um, this has a title now, just saying. Um, it used to just be music masterclass theme music, and that's what it says here. But I've decided I'm going to use this as a demonstration for my MuseCore 4 course to show you how to actually, you know, what's involved in creating a string quartet arrangement as far as MuseCore is concerned. So I decided it should have its own name so it, you know, it doesn't get confused. It's the music masterclass theme, but it's the it's a MuseCore 4 demo, right? So it has a name now. It's Symposium, right? A symposium is kind of what this is. And a symphony is a symphony, so this is a symposium. There you go. That's the name of this theme now. So, um, again, thanks, everyone. And um, uh, the link, again, Dan, is up higher in the thing, and, and uh, we'll make sure that it's in the, uh, in the recording, you know, where, where we post it also. Um, in fact, I have it still up, right? Do I have it handy? There it is. Here's the title. There we go. All right, so thanks, everyone. Keep posting music. Looking forward to seeing what we can talk about next time. All right, see you later. Bye.